Hi there. In this video, we'll be discussing a very important topic. But before we get started, I just wanted to remind you that at the end of the video, be sure to check out the comments section for a link to more information. Thanks for watching. On the screen we have a pressure gauge specially designed to work with RSI X100 or refrigerant gas. Remember that this gas works with quite low pressures compared to other refrigerants. The pressure values for RSI X100 are values below atmospheric pressure. As the values of the manometer are calibrated to mark zero when it is exposed to the pressure of the environment, the pressures that RSI X100 will have are negative because it has a pressure below the atmosphere. As it is difficult to have a precise measurement for such small pressure values, it is highly recommended to work with RSI X100 only with special manometers for this gas. This manometer clearly brings the temperature scale together with the depression in a very simple way. Thus, for example, for a low temperature of minus 10 degrees Celsius, we only have to wait for the needle to stop with the equipment turned on at the value of minus 10 degrees Celsius. In this way the following pressure value is obtained. In addition to using the appropriate pressure gauge, RSI X100 a refrigerant gas charging must be carried out, so the appropriate pressure gauge must be used to make the needle pressure heat stop. The value of the needle pressure should be taken into account that the pressure of the needle pressure stops, and the pressure of the needle stops. The needle pressure value must be taken into account that the needle pressure stops, in addition to using the appropriate pressure gauge, the RSI X100 a refrigerant gas charge must be carried out by weight, thus reducing the chances of error. RSI X100 a can be charged in both the liquid and vapor phases. Now we are going to verify what will be the value of the high pressure. For an environment of 20 degrees Celsius, we are going to have an average condensing temperature of about 30 degrees Celsius. Now let's set the needle to 30 degrees Celsius and note the pressure value. If we want to know the pressure that the equipment should have being turned off, we are going to search the manometer for the value of the ambient temperature. That is, we place the needle at 20 degrees Celsius and thus we can read the pressure value. We are going to see two fundamental characteristics of the capillary for RSI X100 a gas. 1. RSI X100 a has a larger capillary diameter, or it is shorter than the capillary for 134A. 2. In case of using a RSI X100 a compressor, with 134A, and the characteristics of the capillary are not changed, the compressor will be forced since too much refrigerant will enter its suction, increasing electrical consumption. Remember that the RSI X100 a compressor has the largest displacement, since the specific volume of RSI X100 has almost double that of Rho 134A. Now my partner is going to show you some rules, before showing the RSI X100 a capillary table. Recommendations for sizing a capillary tube without errors. 1. Let's start by saying that capillary tubes depend both on their length as its diameter to determine its total restriction. 2. The mission of the capillary is to delay the passage of refrigerant that reaches the evaporator to maintain the low pressure that causes the suction of the compressor. 3. The two variables to take into account for the selection of the capillary are mainly the temperature, the evaporator and the cooling capacity or cooling capacity of the compressor. Or, we must not confuse the cooling capacity with the electrical power of the compressor, the latter normally measured in HP. 5. There are tables that allow selecting the capillary, taking as reference, the electrical power of the compressor motor in HP. However, it is best to use the cooling capacity of the compressor, measured in BTUs per hour, kilocalories per hour, or watts. 6. The problem of using the HP as a selection parameter is that for the same value of this, you can have different cooling capacities, since it will influence the efficiency of the compressor. 7. 
A percentage change in capillary diameter can change the flow of refrigerant, arriving at the evaporator, more than an equal change in the length of the capillary tube. 8. However, the restriction offered by the capillary can also be changed by lengthening, or by shortening the tube, using this method for the final calibration. 9. The time comes to reach extra long lengths of the capillary. To increase restriction and reduce flow is not only wasteful, but frequently useless. 10. As the length of the capillary tube decreases, the flow slowly increases until at the critical point is reached, where the flow rate increases more rapidly with each reduction in length. 11. If the length continues to decrease, a point is reached where a further decrease of the length of the capillary causes an increasing flow. 12. When the capillary tube is so short, even small changes in its length will cause large increases in flow. This is due to the fact that the length no longer affects the flow, and the tube now begins to act more like an orifice than a capillary tube. 13. As a general recommendation, keep the capillary tube no shorter than 5 inches, nor longer than 16 inches. As with all general rules, of course there are exceptions, but for daily operation, staying in this range will eliminate many problems. 14. On the screen we have a table that allows us to select the diameter and length of the capillary that will work with RSI X100. 15. To make the selection, we must know an approximate cooling capacity of the compressor. 16. Many systems that work with RSI X100, they work with an evaporator temperature of minus 20 degrees Celsius. For example, for minus 20 degrees Celsius and the following cooling capacity, we have these dimensions. Thanks for joining us.